Now, we've had a text in from Dan. Is the US coach's son going to Everton? Let's kick off. Sean, what's your answer? That's a good question. It's funny <laughs> because I really wanted to talk about Michael Bradley on this program. Three years ago, I saw Michael Bradley in the mix. He came to Major League Soccer as a 17-year-old was selected by New York. That was his father's club at the time. Bob Bradley was managing New York. He never played. There was a lot of talk about nepotism. Michael Bradley looked really small, slight of build. He had a good first touch, but he just looked like a boy amongst men. And then he started getting called into the U.S. And then he became first choice for the U.S. And people, including a lot of U.S. internationals, were rolling their eyes privately behind Coach Bradley's back. His son has turned into a phenomenal footballer. He has been one of the top scorers this year in the Dutch era, Divisi. I think that he is destined for a move to the Premiership. You may actually see a bidding war. I don't know who's going to end up with him. I think that he will be coming to the Premiership. He is a very talented footballer. He can play in the central midfield. He can hold. He can create. He can play as the number 10. This is an American that, for whatever reason, people have not talked a lot about. He's always been overshadowed. He's about the same age as Freddie Adu, and I think that that's hurt him because so much talk was about Freddie Adu, but this is a star in the making. The two best Americans right now are Josie Altidore, the striker who I've talked about loads of times on the World Football Phone and who I'll be doing his television match. He's Juan Pablo Angel, strike partner at New York Red Bulls, and the other is Michael Bradley. These are two really, really good players. I think you'll both see them. Certainly Bradley feature on May 28th when the U.S. is away to England at Wembley Stadium. Okay, thank you. Tim. Tim Vickery in Brazil. Now you're called the Legendino. Well, um, yeah, and I've never called myself that. To be well, honest. no, uh, the, the best tag names never get called. You know, you never call yourself Legendino. But why? No, no, why? I, I would like to make it clear at this point that Tim Vickery has never referred to himself in the third person either. <laughs> Excellent. Now, you're going to be appalled at my lack of world football, I have to tell you that. And I'm going to need some severe hand-holding, not only from you two, but from listeners as well. So uh, text us in or phone in and criticise my pronunciation, for example, of <laughs> Copa Libertadores. That was really good. Yeah, that was, yeah, yeah. That, that was terrific. That was it was a rubbish terrific. accent, though. You always have to do things like that, don't you? Put accents on it. So it just sounds better. Um, now, they've reached the last eight. Are the continent's traditional powerhouses dominating? Well, no, not really. We could have one or two surprise packets in, in the uh, semi-finals. We've had the first leg of the quarterfinals last week. Boca Juniors, the reigning champions, they've won it four times this decade. They can only draw 2-2 two, two at home to Atlas of Mexico, who uh, are coming through as one of the surprise packets, as are a club from Ecuador called LDU, who managed to draw 1-1 away at San Lorenzo of Argentina. So both those sides who drew away are in a very, very strong position for, for the, the home leg. We've got an all-Brazilian tie. Sao Paulo beat Fluminense 1-0 in the first leg. They're two strong, strong teams, the best defensive records in the competition. So that, that, that's evenly balanced. And America of Mexico beat Santos of Brazil 2-0. And with the away goals rule, that means that if, if America get one in next week's uh, um, return match, then Santos have to get four. So they're in a very, very strong position. And, and, uh, and their striker is perhaps coming up as, as the man of the tournament. He's a Paraguayan striker called Salvador Cabanas. And uh, a few weeks ago, the Brazilian press were just laughing themselves silly about him because he's, well, to be honest, he's a fat little guy. He is a fat little guy. <laughs> Uh, and uh, the, the Brazilians were looking at him and saying, well, uh, how, can he, how can he possibly play football? But he was the top scorer in the Libertadores last year. They <laughs> seem to, for, to have forgotten that. Uh, and he eliminated almost single-handedly. He eliminated Flamengo of Brazil, a huge club, with a dramatic 3-0 win here in Rio uh, just about 10 days ago. And he scored both the goals. The fat little guy, Salvador Cabanas, he scored both the goals for America that leave them in a strong position against Santos. So uh, no one in Brazil is laughing at the fat little guy, Salvador Cabanas, the Paraguayan striker who plays for America of Mexico. Short men every, uh, everywhere are rejoicing. That's good. Now, Cleo's in Aldershot. Uh, Cleo, thanks for joining us on Hello, Apple Night. Penny. Welcome to your first cap, so to speak. I know. <laughs> I must say, I, I do like a discussion about football. I do. It's, it's just excellent one, it's Jim. friendly, isn't it? It is very. Well, I've unless you're talking question. about Rangers, of course, but yes. yeah. El Legendino and for the big wheel. For El Legendino... Dunga has announced his squad for the two friendlies uh, in the US against Canada, Venezuela, and of course the 2010 World Cup qualifiers. Adriana, who I've often talked about and admire greatly, has been recalled. Ronaldinho, unfortunately, has been dropped. But Adriana scored an excellent goal in the Copa Libertadores against uh, Fluminense. Very vital goal. They won 1 0. And for the big wheel. Hello. Hi, Cleo. Hello. Um, 
you were aptly named the big wheel because by night you're a sports commentator, but by day you're running a, a Ford franchise uh, in, in, in California. Yes, the Sean Wheelock, yes. I think I there love must it. be a, hang a on, name Hang on, we've got to stop there. Cleo, the big wheel. Ha! <laughs> We've done really? it. There's a, really, huh. there's someone with my name that. running a Ford dealership. Yeah, That's interesting. Yeah, of course, Sean Wheelock, can you do me a deal on the Ford Galaxy? <laughs> my daughter's just presented me my third grant by the future junior gunner. I wonder if people call him up and ask him football questions. I know, That's I very wondering. interesting. Yeah, your question there, Sean, is about um, the U.S. Cup. I've got three friendlies and a, a vital World Cup qualifier. They're playing England on the 28th, which I hope you're coming over for. They're playing Spain in Santander. They're playing uh, Argentina in uh, the New York um, Giants Stadium, I think. And they're playing Barbados in the um, B&Q uh, Depot, or whatever it's called. <laughs> it's <laughs> Home Depot Center, very close. Not Pizza Hut Park, mind you. Not Dick's Sporting Goods Park, but Home Depot Center. Okay, well, let's, um, <laughs> let's go to Tim first. Brazilian squad announced. Adriano in, Ronaldinho out. Yeah, well, Ronaldinho is no surprise because uh, he's he's been injured. Adriano went back to on loan to São Paulo because of uh, his personal problems, especially a problem with with alcohol, uh, and he's just clawed his way back. And São Paulo have only scored nine goals in in their nine games in the competition this year, and he's got five of them. Uh, and in midweek against Fluminense, he was just immense. He didn't only score the goal; he, he, he set it up as well. He was he was dropping back to to link the play, and he's just so physically huge and imposing. Uh, one one Brazilian journalist said it was like watching an 18-year-old playing against 13-year-olds, and he, he he really was that. He, he was a class above, uh, and so fully fully deserves his his recall to to the Brazilian national team. And it's wonderful to see someone who's had some hard times come back and start fulfilling his potential. Um, so that, that, that that's terrific to see. And can I be the first, since uh, since this subject has already been been, uh, uh, been mooted, can I be the first to suggest uh, Penny, some mothers do, Haslam? <laughs> <laughs> that's rubbish. I have to get a better one. Clea, what do you think of that? Penny, some mothers do, Aslam. No, no. Woman in black. Yeah, yeah. OK. Now, over to, to um, Sean then, the big wheel. US, USA Bradley squad, including is... lots of USA players. What do you think? Well, Bob Bradley is really getting America ready for their opening World Cup qualifier as they enter into the second round. Just a brief overview. And CONCACAF, the top nations by seed are held out into the second round. Then they play a two-leg format. And so the United States has drawn Barbados. And... I know a lot of people might be snickering, thinking, well, who's Barbados? Barbados is a very talented squad. They're one of the better sides in, in all of the Caribbean. And a nation like Barbados looks at Trinidad and Tobago with a population of just over 1.1 million and thinks if Trinidad and Tobago can reach a World Cup as they did in Germany two summers ago, why not Barbados? Mm -hmm. Barbados, two World Cup qualification cycles ago in 2002, actually had the United States in the final match. They were leading. They almost, and it was a big almost, but they almost put the U.S. out in the semifinal round stage. I don't think Barbados is going to the World Cup. I don't think they're going to defeat my country, but I think it's going to be a much more difficult two-leg fixture than a lot of people probably are thinking at first glance. Barbados is a tough side. They've got footballers that play in the Republic of Ireland, that, that play conference football in England and in Scotland, and they can actually do some things cohesively, but Bob Bradley, the U.S. manager, is not taking Barbados lightly, certainly. As Cleo just said, listen to this fixture list. Away to England at Wembley on May 28th, then away to Spain on June 4th, then home to Argentina just outside of New York, 10 miles outside of Manhattan at Giant Stadium on June 8th, then in Los Angeles, not at the B&Q Center, but at the Home Depot Center <laughs> versus Barbados. Bradley's called in 33 footballers to this squad. He's probably going to look at close to 55 before he settles on a World Cup squad if indeed the U.S. does qualify for South Africa 2010. Of the 33 that have initially been called in for the these four fixtures, eight are based in the Premiership, plus who we were talking about earlier, the coach's son, Michael Bradley, who at least still for a few more days anyways with Heron Veen of the Dutch Eredivisie until he moves to the Premiership. That'll likely happen in the July transfer window. Our good friend of the World Football phone in, Freddie Adu, is called into the squad. Josie Altidore of New York Red Bulls. Landon Donovan, who I think is the best Yank in or out of Major League Soccer, in or out of the Premiership into the squad. It's going to be interesting to see what the U.S. does with England and with Spain, to see their level of intensity, because they don't want to embarrass themselves, but obviously all of the focus is on Barbados. It looks good to say you've defeated England or Argentina or Spain, but the match that really matters is June 15th versus Barbados in that opening World Cup qualifier. But I'll just say, uh, on the eve of the um, FA Cup final, the oldest 
knockout trophy in the world, my Harry Redknapp story. I used to manage a betting shop in Frimley, near where I live, and Harry Redknapp came in one evening. We had evening racing going on. Uh, it was that like June 2004. He'd been playing golf at Wentworth. He came into my shop, and I've got a massive picture of my grandson, who's about eight months old at the time, in his full Arsenal regalia, his little short T-shirt. And he was holding the, um, an Arsenal dog lead, because even my dog is an Arsenal supporter. And <laughs> Harry Redknapp laughed. And Harry Redknapp, as a child, was taken to see Arsenal sit in the North Bank with his father. People think he's, you know, West Ham through and through, but no, he said he was born and brought up uh, an Arsenal sport. And he was, he was so lovely with all the customers. He came in and he signed um, a uh, programme. I've been up to Martin Kearns' testimonial of my son and my niece and my sister. And I said to him, Harry, you can't go wrong with the next Arsenal player. And he's taken my advice. Look, he's got um, Laurent, he's got Carnu, he's got Diara, and the man who Dotton claimed as hiding in my garden shed a few years ago, Sol Campbell. <laughs> so there you go. I'd even got a five-pan tip from him, so I can't say for it. He's a lovely chap, and I wish him all the best. Now, he's had a terrible the last few weeks. He lost his sister-in-law, Pat Lampard, to cancer, mm. uh, to pneumonia, sorry. And he's had you know, a lot of trouble with uh, is it that. So I just wish him all the best, and I hope they do win. Cleo, was Sol Campbell hiding in your garden shed? He was going to turn out for Aldershot Town, actually, but he thought better of it. <laughs> so you're a gooner at home, but I what am. about abroad? You talk, what about abroad? Who's your favourite team around the world? And the, well, Boca Juniors. I've had a lot of time for Boca Juniors. I always follow their results. And, of course, I follow um, FC Dallas because they're managed by a former Arsenal uh, player, Steve Morrow. That's that exactly right. right. Clear, yeah. you know, all the times you've called into this show and you're maybe my favourite listener, you're certainly in the top five, and I think you're number one on most nights, certainly tonight. I never knew who your MLS side was, so I have Dallas on American television in a couple of weeks. I'm going to tell Stevie Morrow that you said hello. I think I he'll, he'll be well chuffed on that. On um, Channel 5 over here, we do get MLS football a snippet. It's on at 4 o'clock in the morning, so set your videos. But I saw a player this morning, <laughs> number 10 Blanco, I've never. He's built like a rugby player, but he scored a fantastic goal. He plays for Chiefs. Chief he plays for Chiefs. Chicago. He's been called the Mexican Beckham. Cuauhtémoc Blanco is 35. He's clearly past his best. But in the <laughs> 90s, there was no bigger star in Mexico. And Tim, I know that you're nodding your head knowingly in Brazil mm -hmm. because the legend, I think, of Cuauhtémoc Blanco even went to South America. Marvelous. What he is known for internationally is at World Cup 98, he put the ball between his legs along the touchline, and he actually hopped over the defender. And that's a signature move for his. He did it loads of times, and I mean loads of times in Mexican league football, but to do it in the World Cup, that really kind of cemented his legend. And even at 35, you see him, and he looks easily a stone it's and a, a half It's a bit flashy, overweight. though, isn't it? Flashy. It is, but, you know, it's quite the <laughs> it's, it's, it's the great Blanco, but... I, I had Chicago actually uh, three weeks ago on American television, and I'm thinking, how is he going to be running around? It was a Sunday afternoon match, and he's not fit at all. I he's know, not he's a big trained. guy, yeah, he was puffing and panting, but he scored a 20-yard stunner. He's brilliant. He he really is brilliant. Um, on most days, he is the best midfielder, with apologies to David Beckham in Major League Soccer. His vision is extraordinary. His shot is extraordinary. It's nice to see players like Beckham, and Beckham is performing extremely well, and we'll talk about that over the World Football Phone in tonight. I beg the referee's indulgence. Barcelona signed this strategic plan with the MLS. What does that mean, and who's going to benefit from it? Major League Soccer is going to benefit from that. What that essentially means is that Barcelona is going to come over a minimum of six times for friendlies against either a Major League Soccer select all-star squad, although that won't be this year. The MLS All-Stars are facing, facing West Ham at the end of July in Toronto. But look for Barcelona to play the MLS All-Stars in one of the next two or three summers, and they'll play other friendlies, a total of six it could be more. It's a chance for Barcelona really to spread their name like Manchester United has been doing, like Chelsea has been doing in this country. I hate to be cynical about it, but sometimes it's really about selling shirts. It's getting out there. It's selling the shirts. I know Barcelona working with UNICEF, and they've been brilliant, and they're not a greedy club whatsoever, but it's creating that awareness for Barcelona. It also gives them a chance to come play some pretty high-level friendlies in the summer and just get people excited about Barcelona football, but Major League Soccer is clearly the winner in this deal. But Sean, there are complaints, aren't there, about teams overworking. I know they get paid very well, but there is a sort of rest time during the summer for them. Barcelona 
Barcelona, six games a year over to the States. It's a bit wearing them out, isn't it? Well, Penny, it's six times, uh, six matches over the next five years, so you think they'll play one ah. or two. <laughs> but still, no, fair I'll, point. Uh, I'll let them have jet lag for a day a year, yeah. Well, no, no, it's a fair point, though, because when you look, when Manchester United has come over and Celtic came over for two matches last year, Everton has been over recently. Obviously, Chelsea played in what was called the World Series of Football. That was in Beckham's debut. We did right here on Up All Night, the live commentary on Five Live for LA Galaxy versus Chelsea. Those are more matches sometimes than I think the footballers even bargain for. You think how short this summer is now for the footballers that are playing in Euro 2008. Obviously, England doesn't have that problem. They probably wish they did. But think if you're playing in the Champions League semifinal or final or the UEFA Cup semifinal or final, and then you have, what, a week off, 10 days off, two weeks at the most, and then if you're an international playing in Euro 2008, you have to get ready for that. You come back, and if you're playing for a side that's big, they're probably going to be headed to the United States or Japan or Australia or somewhere in the off season. It used to be they got six or seven weeks off, but it's more and more matches, and of course, that's all driven by money. The players make such huge wages because they have to do a lot of things like play these sorts of friendlies in the summer. Cleo, thank you for your call. Enjoy Go the rest ahead. of the phone-in. Andrew in Blackheath in London. Good morning, Penny. Good morning. I like the way you call us a kind of, you know, spreading the joy amongst both of our guests. Oh, yes, because um, uh, now, uh, uh, Dotton uh, always is very strict, and he says to people, this is a world soccer phone-in, don't talk about English teams. Mm. However, he You've got a question me because he and I both support Charlton. Ah, yes. Now, Dotton was meant to go to a match with you, wasn't he, a little oh, while ago? Oh, well done. That's right. And um, his, his maybe her indoors had a her little... Her indoors, mm, and he That's said, what your stop, suspicions stop were. Stop embarrassing him on the air because I said, her indoors put her foot down. Well, he's not here now and she's always doing Carol. it. Charming <laughs> <laughs> so he, 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 instead, I gave a ticket, would you believe, to a Millwall supporter. But you but won it, that day, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, we won four-one, and the, he, even the Millwall chap. And um, Dotton wasn't there to jinx it. No, he was. <laughs> <laughs> you know a lot about us. Well done, Penny. <laughs> well, I know nothing really, but you're here to help, Andrew. You've got a question for Tim, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, a question both for Tim and uh, 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 but for Sean first. And in fact, it, it, he'll know what I'm talking about. It uh, concerns a next Charlton player. Now, Sean, uh, two or three weeks ago, I told you that mistakenly, Charlton had released Corey Gibbs, uh, the, the, the excellent uh, USA player who had been injured. Uh, you said he'd have no trouble finding a team. Any updated news on him? Has he found anywhere, uh, uh, Sean, to, to, to play next season? To my knowledge, he has not. The The most recent Corey Gibbs update I have is really not that good of Corey Gibbs news. Uh, I was saying earlier, Bob Bradley has just named <clears throat> his 33-man preliminary squad yeah. for these three friendlies, England, Spain, Argentina, and then the June 15th qualifier versus Barbados. Corey Gibbs is not in that squad. Now, things could change, and it really doesn't mean anything. Again, Bradley's going to use 55 footballers at least. Uh, but as of right now, Gibbs is out of contract. You have to think that this is now the closed season, and People are going to be evaluated. There's going to be closed-door training sessions. Physicals are going to be taken. Look for some move probably once the transfer window opens up in July. But Corey Gibbs is going to have to go to a prospective club, and he's going to have to show that he's injury-free. And it's a shame because, you know, we've talked about this a lot on the program. Yep. It's not just one injury. It's a series of injuries. This is someone who's been in the Premiership. He's been in the Bundesliga. He's been in the Dutch Eredivisie. He's been in Major League Soccer. He has excelled everywhere that he he is gone, but the injuries have just been troubling. I mean, firsthand, you, you can tell our listeners, right, when you saw Gibbs on the rare occasion when he was fit, didn't he look like something special? Tremendous player, yeah. yeah. As I said, I compared him with the present Charlton uh, 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 sent house out kindly. They look like cart horses compared to him. <laughs> you know? I do want to mention, too, I talked about Cleo being in my top five. You know you're in my top five as well. Ah, Penny, thank you. Penny, you're getting all the good callers tonight. I think they're turning up for your debut. I'm very impressed, actually. Now, um, I did mention that you can phone us and text us and email and all the rest of it, but you can also send your quest questions for Tim at any time to his weekly South American football column on the BBC Sport website, bbc.co.uk forward splash. Forward splash? <laughs> Dear me. Forward slash sport. Now, Andrew, your question for Tim. Please. Uh, hi, sir, Tim. How are you? Very well, thanks. Uh, Tim, a question about the South American uh, World Cup qualification uh, uh, games. 
gone quiet. I know Brazil weren't doing very well last time you spoke about it. Has there been a sort of a, a, a close season on it? And uh, if not, who who's doing well, who isn't doing so well? Well, we had the first four rounds last year, uh, oh. kind of um, September, uh, October, November time. Then that the whole thing kind of goes to sleep until next month. We've got uh, another couple of rounds coming up in June, including the big one, the biggest international game of them all um, for, for, for my Argentina, liking. Which Brazil, is, yeah? That's right. All, um, this time Brazil-Argentina because oh, yeah, it's, uh, Brazil will be staging it. And that's, that's just a fantastic, fantastic occasion. At the moment, well, Paraguay have started uh, extremely well. Uh, Brazil and Argentina are up there as well. will, will I think, have no problems qualifying. And Colombia have also started well. But it, it, it's, it's still early days. We've had four rounds of a total of 18. The 10 countries, they play each other home and, uh, home and away. And it is quite a strange competition because there are such huge gaps between, between the games. Now, the, the campaign, as I said, it started last year. We had four rounds and, and then a break for like seven months before before um, the next round of games. So it's perhaps difficult for, for uh, national teams to keep their momentum going with such a long gap between, um, between games. So I think we're going to get some inconsistency um, o over the course of the campaign, which, which will only finish... Uh, in kind of October of 2009, so it's a long, it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. But I think the one, the one thing that we can, we can almost guarantee, looking at it, is that uh, neither Brazil or Argentina are going to have too many problems making sure of their place in South Africa in 2010. Thanks so much, Tim. And by the way, still looking forward to uh, meeting up with you, Dot, Dot, and myself when you when you come over to England later in the year. <laughs> yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks, Penny. You're very welcome. Thank you. Guys, we've got a quick question from you, for you from uh, Matt in Stoke. Can we ask Tim how Curlon is doing, please? Well, Curlon um, is, is the footballing seal. He's the young man who invented this seal dribble where he flicks the ball onto his forehead and, and runs at pace, changing direction while, while balancing the ball on his forehead uh, and uh, caused a real sensation in the South American Under-17 Championship uh, about three years ago when he unleashed this move. And, and ever since then, there's been lots of speculation linking him to this club and that club and the other club. Unfortunately, his career ever since has been one injury after another. Um, he missed almost all of last year with, with an injury. It was six or eight months with a knee injury. And the curse struck again in January. He went down with, a, with a, again, a serious knee injury in January. So he, he's not back fit yet. Uh, we'll maybe be back in, in a couple of months. Uh, and uh, it, it's a question of still waiting for him to, him to deliver. He's, at the moment, he was an under-17 star who hasn't made the senior breakthrough. He hasn't managed to score one goal yet in the Brazilian Championship for his club, Cruzeiro. Uh, and we just have to wait for, for him to get fit again and hope that, uh, that that talent that he undoubtedly has, because he was many more things apart from the, the, the seal dribble. And perhaps it was a case that uh, the seal dribble overshadowed him a little bit. So he, he was under pressure to show off this move. Uh, maybe he should, uh, when he does get himself back, he should, he should just forget it for a while and concentrate on the basics. But he's now 20 uh, and still hasn't made the, the, the senior breakthrough. So uh, we're, um, we're, we're hoping that uh, the talent will win out. But it's, t it's taking the scenic route, unfortunately. Would a trick like that be frowned upon over here in the UK? Would it be a seen like as a that kind was, of... has been really, really frowned upon in South America. OK. Um, and especially in South America, I think, because... Does it break uh, any sort of rules? No, no, it doesn't break any rules at all. And it's, it's quite difficult to, to defend against. Um, but uh, it, South American football, one of the key aspects, one of the key kind of motors of it, if you like, is humiliation. Um, I remember the, the, the Newcastle, when uh, the Colombian striker, Esprilia, when he came over to play for Newcastle, uh, one of the things that uh, most uh, bemused him was that the fact that the English supporters tended to get most excited when their team won a corner. Um, because, you know, for him, from, for someone from Colombia, a corner, oh, someone's got to go all the way out there and, and take the corner. Whereas the South American crowd, the, the moment that really gets them on their feet is when someone is made to look stupid. Uh, if, uh, if, if I do a little feint and the opponent falls on the floor, even if he's immediately back on his feet, he's been made to look ridiculous for that little, uh, that little second. And that, that will really get the crowd going. And uh, so the, the opponent's... 
Uh, when, when Curlon was doing this seal dribble, the, the, the opponents were seeing this as a form of humiliation. Uh, and uh, I remember when, when he unleashed it in this South American Under-17 championship, there was a Colombian defender who just came right across and, and <coughs> whacked him into Rosetta of the stands and didn't even wait for the red card. He knew it was coming, but he wandered off very happy with his evening's work. You know? um, I'm not surprised so he's it, got it, a knee injury with flammatory work like that then. Well, Everyone's uh, out to get him. Yeah, well, the, the injury that, that he suffered was uh, that he just that he suffered in January w was one of those where there's no contact with another player, and that, that tends to, that tends to be the worst kind with, with an injury when it when it's not it's not a knock, it, it's it, it's an internal break, um, which is it, it, it's a very very worrying sign. But yes, mm. this uh, this seal dribble was proving very very controversial with opponents barging him over and and, and so on, and it's 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 a move that uh, unfortunately I think is going to land up uh, land him in, in, in hospital uh, if he tries it on a regular basis and at the wrong time it's something that he needs to learn when to use and as i was saying it was overshadowing him as a footballer and as he still hasn't established himself at senior level it, it might be a good mm. thing for him to just forget about it for a while okay i hope matt in stoke is satisfied with that answer now Stuart in belfast hello hi hello you want to know about a couple of players don't yeah. you and how they're doing yeah sure go ahead all right well um the first question is really for tim here um how are you doing I'm very well, thanks, Stuart. What's on your mind? Um, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure I'll be familiar about the guy, but um, Alvaro Rukoba, who's currently on loan at Torino, what are your thoughts yep. on him as a player and why he hasn't quite really made it? Torino, then. Believe, is that another word for the bull? I can't believe that Rukoba is, what, 31, 32. He's just someone who's, who just seems like an eternal adolescent. And perhaps he, pl he pl plays a little bit like an eternal adolescent. Wonderfully, wonderfully talented left-footed Euro um, Uruguayan attacking midfielder or striker. The talent is all there and, and, and always has been. Um, the problem has been delivering on the big occasion. Um, and I think he's, 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 he's let people down. I think his poor performance was probably responsible for Uruguay not making it to the last World Cup in, a, in a, the, the playoff against Australia. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's just a case of, of someone who's, who, who ha for whatever reason, perhaps there's, there's one or two mental screws loose there, um, hasn't quite fulfilled his potential. Um, but uh, when, on those occasions when he has clicked, I think he's given a lot of pleasure to a lot of people because the, the, talent, the, the talent that he has is quite extraordinary. Um, also, I was looking, there's a player, I can't remember, I should really, it's shameful I've forgotten this, I think it was last week you were talking about him. There's a player, I think he's playing in um, Brazil, um, but he's not Brazilian. I think the second name's Mourinho, and he's known as two different names or something. That's right, yeah, he's, he's, he was, he's uh, a striker. Um, his name is Marcelo Martins in Bolivia or Marcelo Moreno in Brazil. Now, the confusion here is that he was born in, in, um, in Bolivia to a Brazilian father. Uh, and in, in Bolivia, that they followed the name of his father. Uh, in Brazil, they don't really understand this South American names business, and they've, they've just gone for the last, the last of the two surnames, which is the name of his mother. So he's Marcelo Martins in Bolivia and Marcelo Moreno in Brazil, where he plays. He's a, a, a target man centre forward who reminds me a little bit of Gabriel Batistuta, and that's praise indeed. He's not as quick as Batistuta, uh, and, uh, and he would say himself that his first touch need, needs to be improved a little bit. Um, but he's got a lot of power, finishes very well off either foot, lot towering headers, um, can hold the ball up very well. Uh, scored eight goals in the, in the Libertadores for Cruzeiro. Very, very interesting striker indeed, who, who uh, I, I think will be coming to Europe uh, in, in this, uh, this summer's transfer window. Yeah, I thought I was going to talk about actually. If I was Tottenham today were linked with him, would you think, I think you're a Tottenham supporter as well, would you say that would be a good signing to move straight to Bremership or maybe to go somewhere else in Europe first? Well, he actually refused a move to um, a club from Ukraine. Shakhtar Donetsk came in for him, and he refused that move. And he said that he wanted England or Spain, and Real Madrid is, is his dream club. Um, if we compare him with Berbatov, he doesn't have that silky first touch of Berbatov, uh, and uh, um, he, he would have to adjust a little bit to, 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 to the pace. And the Premiership would, would perhaps be a more difficult first option to come in uh, if compared to, to Spain. You know, with Spain, he's got no problems with the language and all the rest of it. But uh, I do think he's a very, very interesting striker. And as a Tottenham fan, I would be very curious to see him indeed there at White Hart Lane. OK, and Stuart, you've got a question for Sean, haven't you, about yeah, Landon right. Donovan? Yeah, as well. Um, hi, Sean. Hi, Regarding yeah. Landon Donovan, I mean, he's a player whenever I've watched him, he's always looked sort of a cut above the rest of the American team, but... 
Why do you think he never really made it in Europe in his two spells at Leverkusen? And do you think he'll try again at a point in the future? The simple answer is that Landon Donovan really likes his life. He's married to an actress. She's on a CBS television program in the United States. They live in Los Angeles. He makes 900,000 U.S., which is about 455,000 pounds, depending on the exchange rate, which isn't a ton of money, certainly by premiership standards, and he could probably make, what, triple that easy in the premiership. But it's a good salary when you factor in his endorsement money and what he gets for playing for the United States. He's usually over about $1.5 million a year. With the money his actor's wife brings in, they have a really good quality of life. He lost his captain's armband to David Beckham. There was some controversy on that but he still is automatic first choice for LA Galaxy I think and I said it earlier on the program not only is he the best American in Major League Soccer he's the best American full stop I would take him over any Yank in any league in the world I think he is that good he's about to get the captain's armband on a full-time basis for the United States he's soon to break the all-time goal scoring record for the U.S. he's just 26 years old he's somebody that if he stays healthy he could approach 150 maybe 160 caps for the United States and they would be meaningful caps He's someone, if he stays healthy and the U.S. continues to perform well in CONCACAF qualifying, that could appear in four or even five World Cups. I still think that Landon Donovan, somewhere in the back of his mind, looks at a club like Manchester United, who he says that he likes a lot, and thinks, you know what, I could go there and I could contribute. But you're right, he had two unsuccessful spells in Germany at Bayer Leverkusen, and starting when he was 16 years old, he was homesick the first time. The second time when he went back two and a half years ago, he just didn't like it. I don't know if he was homesick at 23 years old. He just didn't like it. He didn't like the weather. He didn't like the culture. He didn't like the coaching. He didn't like the style of football. Landon Donovan has things going his way right now, and it's interesting because in the U.S. football community, with journalists, and I think even more so with fans, they look at Landon Donovan somehow as though he's soft, that he's made a bad decision, that he should be out there really leading the charge of Yanks going into Europe, into the Premiership. Landon Donovan likes his life. I'm going to interview him, <laughs> That look for that in two or three weeks on World Football on BBC World Service. I'm going to pose those questions to him. He certainly has that talent. I'm a huge fan of Landon Donovan as a footballer and as a person. I would like to see him give it a try. I think he's got about three and a half, four years left at his top until he hits the age of 30. And even then, if he's healthy, maybe Landon Donovan, like Brian McBride, who really didn't make a name for himself in English football until after his 30th birthday, could go over. But I think realistically, if Landon Donovan's going to go, he has to go over before he's 30. I think he can do well. But maybe he's just one of those rare footballers that says, you know what? Playing in America from in Major League Soccer for LA Galaxy, representing my country, having a beautiful wife, and having a high standard of life in California, maybe that's enough for me. Maybe I don't need anything else. Sounds like a David Burns song, really, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, Stuart in Belfast, thank you for your call. Cal in Exeter, he's got a question for Tim. I hope I get the pronunciation right. What's Freddie Garin up to these days? I remember you describing an, an encounter with him in a hotel lobby. Sounds intriguing. <laughs> That's going back. Uh, Freddie Guarin is a young Colombian midfielder who um, uh, I was, ha just by coincidence, I was staying in the same hotel that, that he was uh, with, with the, the Colombian under-20 team at the time. Uh, and he'd scored the winning goal uh, for Colombia against Brazil. Uh, and he got it into his head, as all Colombians do every time I go there, that I was Brazilian. As soon as I, because I speak Portuguese and my Spanish is, is kind of badly spoken Portuguese, really. Um, he, he was convinced I was Brazilian. He was in the room next door. There was a lot of noise coming from that room. I don't know what he was doing in there. But every time he saw me, he would run across and remind me that he'd scored the winning goal and that his name was Freddy Guarin. Um, he's, he's uh, well, round, round, been around. He's been around. A uh, little spell at Boca Juniors in Argentina. Uh, and uh, he's currently at Saint Etienne in in France. Um, perhaps a player of more power than finesse, strong, but does strike the ball very well. I don't think he's he's, he's going to be a world beater, um, but uh, he, he's still around in in in, in the Colombian squad. Um, but uh, I don't think when he first came through at under 17 level, he really looked like he might be something. Uh, and uh, perhaps, maybe in retrospect, that was more precocious physical de development than, uh, than than any wonderful skill. But uh, a good player, but I don't think, I don't think he's going to be a great one. Okay, well, thanks for that, Tim. Now, John in London, you're calling in. You've Hello. bucked the trend, and you've only got a question for Tim. Have you nothing to say to Sean? <laughs> 
Hello, Sean. Hi, you can ask <laughs> oh, me about that's... Freddie Adu. We haven't had that in a while. Go on. Well, Aidan Barrow's <laughs> texting about Freddie Adu. I don't know if you want to get onto that before John gets his question. I think that's a bit unfair. Tell you what, John, you asked him about Chilean uh, Matias Fernandez and uh, see how we get on. OK, thank you very much. Hi, John. Hi, guys. How you yeah, basically, um, I'm, I'm a Liverpool fan and... Um, I know we've been linked to Matias Fernandez. We got into, I think it was in January, and I was just wanting to know what you, how you, how you feel he'd do at, at Liverpool, and where you feel he's ready for the move, and you know, and yeah, if he'd be any good, and why do you know why he hasn't played for Villarreal much this season? Well, he's been a regular substitute. Um, he's uh, the man who, who seems to come on. Um, uh, for uh, uh, Pires, the former Arsenal player. Okay. Um, so uh, look where Villarreal. And Villarreal is a tiny little place. And look where they are in the Spanish league. You know, fighting mm. for, the, for for the runners-up position. Uh, so he, he often comes off, uh, um, off the bench, plays the last 20-25. I think he's only scored one, one league goal. But he's set up quite a few. Um, okay. I, I think he's a, he's a very very talented attacking midfielder. Ever since he's come up, he's reminded me a little bit of the young Kaká. Um, when Kaká first first came up, and before he really physically developed, Kaká looked like a foal, like a young foal, and kind of kind of thin little legs. Uh, and, and Fernandez has got a little bit of that about him. He's also as as the young Kaká was, he's, he's very right-footed. I think Kaká has done wonderfully well to work on his left foot. Fernandez, I think, is still more dependent on his right foot. So um, the, the defensive midfielder, if he's wise, he could just kind of shepherds Fernandez towards the left, and that, that yeah. neutralises him a little bit. Um, but he, he's, uh, I, I don't think he's done badly at Villarreal at all. And, and some people were expecting him to, to, to step straight in and, uh, and do exactly the same kind of thing that he was doing for Colo Colo in Chile. And I think that was, that was a, uh, an overambitious thing for, um, for a young player, making a, the, the, step, the step up in physical and technical terms from Chilean football to Spanish football. I don't think he's done badly at all. In terms of a move to Liverpool, I think uh, it's still premature. It's premature because... I would want him to really establish himself in the in the Villarreal first team and get a okay. get a good season or, or a season and a half behind him, um, in, in in you know being automatic first choice before I thought about him for the Premiership, especially as Fernandez is known as being a little bit introverted, fairly shy kind of character. So you know you, you take a shy character out of his natural language in, in, into to, to a new language, and and that's something that. Uh, um, is is very often the, the cause for moves not working out, you know, just just sure. simply because the, the player is not happy off the field. So in in Rafa Benitez's shoes, I would be following um, Fernandez's progress, but I would be reluctant to part with my money just yet. John, are you satisfied with that answer? I am. It, would it be okay for us to one more question? I'll go on then. Well, Sean's gagging. I tell you, he's he's <laughs> chomping at the bit. But go Sorry. on. Go on. It's very quick. Um, hi, uh, Tim. It's about Lucas Leiva. I just want to know. Um, um, you know, how do people feel about him in Brazil? Is he highly rated or is he sort of like just another, another, you know, average player? How do they view him over there? No, he was, he was very highly rated, and he he was captain of, of Brazil's under-20 team, and he was voted the best player in last year's Brazilian championship, so very highly rated. Obviously, by by moving so early, that means that you do fall off the radar screen a little a little bit, and I think we knew when he moved to um, to, to Liverpool that any, anything that he got in that first season was going to be a bonus, because he was moving to a side that had so many central midfielders, you were thinking, how is he going to get an opportunity? But I think he's already already climbed up the totem pole and, you know, Sissoko has left for, for, for Italy and so on. Um, so I think next season is the vital season for um, Lu Lucas Leiva. Brazil need him at international level as well. Um, they don't produce a lot of central midfielders who, who, who are as good all-rounders as Lucas Leiva. Yeah. And, in, and, you know, Brazil, the, the central midfield duo that they've been picking, uh, Gilberto Silva and Mineiro. You know, Gilberto Silva is a converted centre-back um, centre who doesn't really offer a great great deal um, when you're in possession and Mineiro is just a runner um, yeah, Lucas yeah. Is, is a much better player than either of those two uh, so I, th I think Brazil need him to develop he's very much in the, in the thoughts of the Brazilian of, of uh, the Brazilian national team selector uh, and, and what, what he really needs now is an automatic first team place and more football than, than he's had just just in the last year and I think he'll get it for Liverpool next season it's, it's the big season for, for him I think sure. okay thanks, thanks John so in that. London thanks Tim Sean Freddie Adu where is he Freddie Adu is at Benfica. This is the first year coming to an end of a five-year contract, and 
There's virtually no way that Freddie Adu is going to play five years at Benfica. It's a very big club, obviously, but this is kind of the transitional move. It's a chance for everyone in the football world to evaluate if Freddie Adu is good enough to play for a major, major club in one of the big four leagues, and nothing against Benfica. I'm a really big fan of the Portuguese league, but when I say the big four, I think that's the Premiership, La Liga in Spain, the Bundesliga in Germany, or Serie A in Italy. He's either going to go to a big club in one of those four leagues or he's going to come back to Major League Soccer. And if he comes back, I think a lot of people will say, well, he's a failure. He came back in disgrace with his head bowed. And that's unfair. There is no way possible that Freddie Adu could ever live up to the hype. There were people, and I'm not saying this out of exaggeration, who knew nothing about football, that when Freddie Adu signed with Major League Soccer at 14, they thought that he was going to be scoring a goal a match. They thought at 14 that he was going to score 30 or 40 goals for the campaign that he was going to be playing in a World Cup. Freddie Adu has turned into a very nice, tidy midfielder. He's in that pool of 33 footballers called in for Bob Bradley's squad. I think there's a very good chance if the U.S. does qualify for South Africa World Cup 2010, he'll be in that 23-man squad. But Freddie Adu is not first choice for the United States right now. He is not even guaranteed of a place in the squad. He wasn't first choice for Benfica. He's coming along. He'll be 19. And we'll let you in on something here. There's a lot of controversy, and I know that you're not aware of this, Penny, but we talk about this a lot. We always say allegedly with Freddie Adu's age. There's a lot of controversy about his age. Now, according to his passport, he'll be 19 in June. But ever since Freddie Adu really became known in the U.S. to the media anyway when he was allegedly a 12-year-old kid, there was a lot of talk that maybe there were a few years shaved off. His parents emigrated to the U.S. from Ghana. Freddie Adu came over when he was eight years old with his younger younger brother. And there's so much talk. In fact, a lot of people just take it as fact that Freddie Adu is three or four years older than the case. But at this point, so what? Whether he's 19 or he's 20 or he's 23, Freddie Adu is doing very well for himself. To be an American, to be playing for Benfica at 23 or 19, it doesn't really matter. And Freddie Adu, I know some people think I've been hard on him on this program. He's not the player that a lot of us in America thought that he would be or even hoped that he would be. He was tabbed as the American play, which kind of is ridiculous because he's not a goal scorer. He's a creator. He's a midfielder. But Freddie Adu is still doing very well for himself. But he's certainly not the phenom people want him to be. He's been bypassed by two young players, both of whom we've talked about in the program. One player who is a legitimate goal scorer, who I'm convinced is headed to the Premiership, that's Josie Altidore. And the other is that creative midfielder who really does a nice job of running the attack for the United States was a goal scorer for Heronveen this year in Holland and that's Michael Bradley both without much fanfare when they were 13 have overtaken Freddie Adu Tim knows this as well we were talking about Curlon earlier just because you can do certain things when you're 15 years old to your peers doesn't mean you're going to be able to do those same things to your peers when you're 20 or 25. Very patiently Alex and Luton has been waiting Alex bless you for waiting so long. Hi there yeah it's okay. I hope it's going to be worth it. Yeah, it is going to be worth it. I must say, Penny, you're doing a lovely job on your debut. Oh, well, bless you. Thank you very much. I'm hanging on in there yeah, with, the, with the help from you guys. Yeah, got a question for Tim. Great, go for it. Hi, Tim. Yeah, Chelsea signed a player in the last uh, transfer window. He's an Argentinian called Frankie DeSantis. They signed him for a Chilean club. I just want to know how good his potential is. Uh, I think he's a, a very interesting young striker. He reminds me a lot of the, the Paraguayan who um, Blackburn bought with such success this season, Rocky Santa Cruz. De Santo has that same beanpole build, um, and obviously being so tall is good in the air, but surprisingly subtle on the ground as well. Um, and uh, a very, very interesting prospect indeed. Had I been De Santo, um, I wouldn't have moved this early in, in, in my career. Uh, I, I honestly think it would have been better for him to have stayed with his Chilean club. Um, just to explain, a lot of people have been confused about how come he's a young Argentinian who, who, who was playing in Chile. Well, he comes from uh, Mendoza in Argentina, which is much, much closer to, to the Chilean border than it is to, to, to Buenos Aires. So he, he found his way to, uh, to Aldax Italiano, a, a small um, club from Santiago, but doing, doing very well. Uh, and he could have stayed and he could have been playing in the Copa Libertadores for them. And I think that, that would have been better experience for, for him at this stage in his career than going to Chelsea and, and, and just playing for the, the reserves. But he's obviously one that Chelsea have bought for the long term. And uh, I, I think he's 
very, very interesting indeed. Um, what we'll have to see when he does finally get this, uh, his first team opportunities with Chelsea, we'll have to see if he's physically ready for the battle because he, he, he although he's tall, he, he's quite frail, frailly built. And there have been some Argentinian centre forwards who've come in to, to English football and, and just found it too physically strong. And an obvious example is Luciano Figueroa, who came into Birmingham City, and Birmingham just got nothing out of him at all. Uh, not a bad centre forward uh, at all, but just not physically capable at that young stage in his career of, of coping with the battering that, that is English, English football. So uh, time will tell if De Santo has made a mistake with his career and moved too soon, but he, he's, he's certainly a very interesting prospect. Tim, do you think in general players who get transferred and perhaps don't do so well, as the player you just mentioned for Birmingham there, get given enough time and support to, to bed in? No. Um, we're, we're living in an age of, of immediate solutions. As with and, Sven Goran Eriksson. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and all, all of this pressure for instant results, immediate results. I also think that... Uh, I, I'm under the impression that, that things are improving now, but I think that in the past um, the English clubs have been have been almost criminally negligent with the lack of support they've given to, to foreign players coming in. I remember uh, Juan Pablo Angel coming in, a uh, Col Colombian who, who Aston Villa bought from, from Argentina. So he'd already had the experience of living abroad, although it was a different... Uh, uh, it, it, this was the first time he was going to, to a, um, a country that spoke a different language. And Angel's wife fell ill, and, and he was just astonished at how little support he got from the club. And the, the, the South Americans in general, they're used to being helped. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, the Anglo-Saxon mm. kind of culture of, you know, Sink you stand on your own two feet, yeah. that, that's, that, that's alien for him. I remember in his first spell in, in, in English football, uh, Hernan Crespo, the Argentinian striker at Chelsea, who'd been years in Italy, you know, so had already adapted to different countries, but he, he gave an interview to the Argentinian press, and he was talking about um, that the things that really frightened him with, uh, with his spell in Chelsea was uh, um, the, the, the guy from the phone companies coming round, or he, he has to take his car to, to the garage, and he has to speak English in these situations. Mm. You know, and you're thinking, well, what on earth are the club doing? They've paid a fortune for him. They're paying him a fortune, you know, but they've they, they, they only care. bought the player. Mm. They've, forgotten, they, they've forgotten the human being. I think now that this is beginning to change, the clubs are, are, are beginning to get cuter, um, but this, this is certainly has been one factor in, in, in the fact that uh, um, for for years, the South Americans weren't really fulfilling their, 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 their potential. I think one of the reasons it's beginning to change now is that now there are more South Americans in English football. It, there's, if you like, a welcoming committee. So, you know, the, the guy coming in, he might have a couple of mates, like uh, um, Santa Cruz played in Germany, in Bayern Munich, and one of his teammates was Owen Hargreaves, who's now at Manchester United. So Santa Cruz comes in, he's already got Owen Hargreaves there, although, although he plays for a different team. It's close enough, you know, just, just to offer him a little bit of support. So a bit of an I expat community. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's very, very important for, for the South American player coming in. We have to remember that these people are not just footballers, they're human beings as well. OK, Alex and Luton, thank you for that. Now, Sean Wheelock, we haven't forgotten about you, but we do have another question from Ben in Winchester for Tim. Now, Ben's been hanging on for a while. So, Ben, what's your question for Tim? Hi, um, well, I've got two questions for Tim and uh, one for Sean, if that's all right. Um, oh, lovely. I love it when you balance it out. That's great. <laughs> should, we Sean Sean should, we, should we do the Sean one first? Let's do the Sean one first. first. Yeah, otherwise his, his, his tongue will seize up. Like I know. And nice. Tim, you might need to have a sip of water. You've been speaking for a long time. That's you know? very sporting of everyone. Thank you. Penny, you're so much more fair and balanced than Dotton. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's those soft skills we women have. <laughs> now, Ben, go ahead. What's your question for Sean? Hi, Sean. Hiya. Um, I just uh, had a couple of questions. Well, one for you about um, the trend for American players um, from the MLS um, seeming to go overseas, and especially to um, Scandinavia, um, such as, I mean, there's Brian West at Fredrikstad, and um, a player called Charlie Davis as well. And I just wondered uh, if you knew anything about that kind of trend and why they specifically choose Scandinavia over other countries in Europe. The the simple answer is that it's a lot easier for them to get the work permit. I think people sometimes forget because football is so globalized now in the premiership, you see footballers from everywhere in the world, that if you come from a, a nation that's not part of the UK and it's not part of the EU, it's very, very difficult to get through. We've talked about Brad Gazan before in this program. He's emerging as one of the great American goalkeepers now. I think by 2010, he'll be second choice to Tim Howard, 23 years old. 
almost moved to Aston Villa from his MLS site, Chivas USA. He could not get his work permit. And this is not an FA issue. This actually goes through the British Home Office, which is the Labor Board. And you're reduced to almost trying to get a work permit. It would be no different if I were trying to move to the United Kingdom. Actually, it's a little different. I have an English wife, but forgetting that for a moment. If I were trying to do, sell my skills as a commentator on football, you have to show certain things to get the work permit. So when you're seeing someone like Charlie Davis going through or Troy Perkins, who was a goalkeeper last year at D.C. United, footballers like that going to a Scandinavian country, they can get work permits. In the 1990s, there was a first wave of Americans. My very good friends, Christopher Sullivan, Peter Vermes, Eric Winalda, all went to play German first and second division football because England was a closed shop. They just could not get in. Italy, Spain were closed shops. It's difficult on country to country to get work permits. You see a lot of Americans going to Holland, going to Belgium now because it's easier to get the work permit. The British labor laws are some of the toughest in football for people coming outside of the UK and outside of the EU, and sometimes they just simply have no other choice. To get a work permit in the UK from the British Home Office to play for a side in any British side, we're talking Northern Ireland, England, Scotland, Wales, you have to have appeared in 75% of your country's internationals over the last two years. That's a pretty big standard if you think about it. Look at Ryan Giggs, for instance, in Wales. How often in a two-year period, I know he's retired, <laughs> point. but how often did he appear in 75% of the matches? What about Michael Owen, even when he was first choice for England with all of his injuries? When in a spell of two years was he appearing in 75%? It's a really, really tough standard. So when you see someone like Brad Gazan, who's emerging but has barely even received a cap, to say, well, you're held to that standard. He can't even hit 5%. It's very, very difficult. If you can establish yourself in a foreign league, even if you don't have that 75% cap, it gives you some ammunition for your case to say, well, I don't have that, but on appeal, I'm good enough. I've shown myself to be of international caliber by playing in another foreign league, playing outside of Major League Soccer.